whether it's galactic collisions, car crashes, American football, or a game of pool, understanding collisions is an important part of understanding the world around us. Why does one car crash look like this, and another car crash, Ooh. Welcome to Flip Physics. Today we're going to talk about collisions, from momentum to impulse to the different types of collisions that we deal with in physics. First question. What is an impulse? An impulse is a transfer in momentum. If an object gains 10 kilograms meters per second of momentum because another object hits it, that object has received an impulse. But I thought you said momentum is conserved. How can an object just gain momentum? I'm glad you asked that, me from 20 seconds ago. I did say that, but conservation of momentum says that momentum in the world is conserved, or maybe the momentum in a closed system. So if you have a closed system where no momentum can escape or enter the system, then within that box, momentum is conserved. So if two balls are inside a box and they hit each other and you stop any momentum from entering or leaving that box, then in that system, momentum is conserved. But one of the balls can still transfer momentum to the other ball. Conservation of momentum just says that if you lose or gain momentum, it has to either come from somewhere or go to somewhere. It can't just disappear. So one billiard ball can transfer its momentum to another, but only if the total momentum of the whole system stays the same. An impulse is a change in momentum that an object undergoes. But in order for an impulse to happen, a force has to be applied. And that force has to be applied over some period of time. Often that period of time is really short, two things hit each other, it tends to be pretty quick, but it is a period of time all the same. So an impulse is also a force multiplied by a time, a force applied over a time. So if an impulse is a change in momentum and it's force times time, then we can make them equal to each other. For those who are interested, you can also derive the equation like this. We call this equation the impulse momentum theorem. It simply says that the impulse received by an object is equal to the change of momentum of that object. The little triangle, the little delta symbol, Greek letter delta, means change. So that's change in velocity, and that's change in time, which is basically just a period of time. Time is always moving, time is always changing. So in this equation, F is the force applied to an object, T is the time period over which that force was applied, M is the mass of the object, and delta V is the change in velocity of the object. So if a 0.5 kilogram baseball is hit with a bat at a force of 500 newtons, and if the bat and the ball are in contact with each other for 0.2 seconds, then we can calculate the velocity of the ball as it goes flying off the bat. We have our equation, we plug the numbers we know in, the force, 500 newtons, the 0.5 kilograms for the ball, and the 0.2 seconds. Divide both sides by the mass of 0.5 kilograms, and we're left with the change in velocity as the subject. Type in a calculator and we get 200 meters per second. Now we just picked some numbers, so that might be completely unrealistic. We'd have to do some experiments to find some of those numbers first. Now let's go back to those car crashes. How are they different to each other? Well, they were different in a lot of ways, so let's look at a simpler version. Watch these two car crashes carefully and write down any differences you can notice between them. You'll probably have to rewind and watch it several times to get a decent list. There are probably a lot of things you could have written down, but there's one that I want you to focus on. One of the car crashes was really clean and bouncy. They kind of bounced away from each other with very little damage. The other car crash, they stuck together and moved through the intersection together. In that second collision, it was a lot more messy. The metal was bent and so forth. In the first collision, not very much mess at all. A lot of that kinetic energy that the car came in was completely converted into heat through friction and all the bent metal in the wanton destruction. But in the other collision, there wasn't much damage at all. Most of the energy was transferred straight from one car into the other. It was only lost later when he pressed on the brakes. In physics, we would say that the cleaner collision was more elastic. I call elastic collisions bouncy collisions. It was more bouncy. Just like an elastic ball tends to bounce. These bouncy elastic collisions conserve a lot more kinetic energy. The amount of movement energy going into a collision is very similar to the amount of movement energy that comes out. In fact, strictly speaking, in physics, an elastic collision is one where no kinetic energy is lost at all. Neither of these collisions were really elastic, it's just that the one where they bounced away from each other was a lot more elastic. So for an elastic collision, if you calculate the total kinetic energy of everything involved before the collision, 
and the total kinetic energy of everything involved after the collision, you'll find out that they're equal. An inelastic collision, on the other hand, is one where kinetic energy is lost. I call these sticky collisions because the objects tend to stick together, just like the cars did in that example. So for one of these collisions, if you calculate a half mv squared before the collision and calculate a half mv squared after the collision, if you calculate the kinetic energy before and the kinetic energy after, you'll find that they're not the same as each other. Kinetic energy is lost to heat, in this case in the bent metal. Here's a question though. Which of the two car crashes was worse for the driver? Certainly the inelastic one looked more messy, but is a messy car crash automatically worse for the people inside? It's often the reverse. Although a messy collision could mean that your passenger compartment is squashed and then you could get injured that way, assuming that you are still intact inside, the shock to your body could actually be better in a messy collision. If we go back to the impulse momentum theorem, we see that F multiplied by T, that's the impulse, is equal to the change in momentum. By the end of a car crash, when all is said and done, the cars are pretty much gonna be stopped. The change in momentum during a collision is gonna be really determined by how fast the cars were going before the collision. If you're going at 50 miles an hour before the collision and after the collision you're stopped, then your change in momentum is gonna be your mass multiplied by that 50 miles an hour and there's nothing you can do to change that. Now again, there is kind of a small print there because you can also stop the brake. And often it's a lot better if you had to press the brake yourself than it is if someone slammed into you so hard that they forced you to stop without doing anything with the brake. That would be bad. But let's just assume that two cars hit each other and after they release, they're pretty much stationary or moving very slow. Then the change in momentum is gonna be just some number that you can't really do much about. It's just determined by how fast you're going. Yes, if you drove slower, you'd be safer, but let's just assume you're driving at the speed limit going about your normal business when some nutter hits you. But on the other side of the equation, this value of t does depend on how the crash goes. If this side of the equation, the change in momentum is constant, then if we increase the time t of the collision, we'll decrease the force. And if we decrease the time of the collision, then we'll increase the force. In other words, if that change in momentum happens over a really short period of time, it happens suddenly, we feel a big force. If it happens more slowly, then we feel a weaker force. And the force you feel is really what determines how this crash feels to your body. This is the same reason that cricket players do this when they catch a ball. When you're catching a super fast ball without a mitt, it hurts. But if you move your hand backwards, you increase the time of the collision. And by increasing the time of collision, you decrease the force on your hand. So a messy collision like this, when the crash happens over a longer period of time, can actually injure the people inside the car less. In fact, a lot of the mess that happens during car crashes is actually because of a safety feature of the cars. Cars have something called a crumple zone, which is an area of the car that's made to crumple, an area that's made to collapse if it's hit. By having parts of the metal collapse in on themselves, it increases the time of the collision and therefore decreases the force on the people inside. In the messy collision I showed you earlier, the people in the car probably were hurt more just because the car going into it was going so much faster. So really, no matter how great your car safety features are, the best way to avoid wanton destruction is just to stick to the speed limit. Thanks for watching Flip Physics. If you like this video, feel free to press the like button. You can also subscribe. But most of all, make sure you leave a comment below with any questions, thoughts, and suggestions. Until next time, keep questioning. If there is a God out there, as I believe there is, there's one thing I know for sure. He's bloody good at math.